uh, but it caused the other side of it, this thing about the consciousness, etc. I think so irritated Brian. I didn't see this bit of it of the on the on the Twitter uh, Twitter world. I, I don't have a Twitter account, <laughs> but um, it so irritated him that he decided he wrote an article for the Wall Street Journal, in which he basically pointed out, you know, he was not implying that um, that that this instantaneous effect of the of the of the electrons reacting to one another can be made use of in terms of sending information. You can't send any information faster than the speed of light. So you can't make use of this to actually say, I know exactly what that person's thinking, because that information simply can't go faster than the speed of light. So there's, there's no, and he called that, I think that article appearing in the Wall Street Journal, as it did, then probably got the physicists over in the USA quite interested in what he was saying. And they came back and saw the video, which was on YouTube by then, and that then led to the physics discussion because the physics underlying it is really interesting. So when Brian Cox did rub that diamond, what was happening to the electrons in Andromeda? They were they were realigning a little bit, they, but not in a way that we can make use of, or not in a way that the the you know the equivalent experimentalist in Andromeda looking at those sets of electrons could make use of. He would have had no idea. She would have had no idea. They would have had no idea what. Brian was doing to the to the to the electrons back in back in uh, on Earth. They, if they made a measurement, the chances of that of any one electron they were measuring being in either an up state or a down state would have been 50-50. Even though they wouldn't have known that Brian had made this uh, observation of the electron on Earth, they wouldn't have been able to tell being in Andromeda. Even though the the wave function itself would have reacted. Now, but but it's quite remarkable. Really. So where does pile exclu exclusion principle come from? Well, I, I like to use the, the following analogy. So think of um, a football match uh, between Liverpool and Man United, and let's say it's a, it's a cup match, so there has to be a result. You know, we're not having draws here. There has to be a result. And then you could assign a quantum number to both Liverpool and a quantum number to Man United, and let me call that quantum number the number of goals that they score in the game. So let's say Liverpool score three, so their quantum number is three, and Man United score one then the result is that Liverpool win. Nothing weird about that. That's really quite enjoyable, actually. Um, now, of course, and it pays me to do this, you could actually reverse those quantum numbers. You could swap them around so that Man United score three and Liverpool score one. And what happens then is, is that you reverse the result. The result goes into the exact reverse. And now, think about what, ha what would happen if both Man United and Liverpool had the same quantum number, if they'd scored the same number of goals. Then we'd have a draw, then we'd have no result. So that's the analog. You know, when the quantum numbers are the same, you end up in this forbidden regime where there's no result. And it's the same for fermions. Only now, instead of a, a result, we're talking about the very existence of the particles. And that's described by the wave function, essentially. Let, let's imagine this situation where you have two particles, two fermions, two electrons. Um, and let's think of a very simplified situation where they only do carry one quantum number. Okay, so we're not thinking of a particularly complicated setup. It's it's you know a toy model if you like. Uh, let's call that that uh, that quantum number spin. The rule is they both can't occupy the same spin. Okay, uh, so let's call the spins up or down. So if one electron is has spin up, the other one must have spin down. Okay, and vice versa. The first electron has spin up. Second electron has spin down. Yeah. Okay, that's one possibility. The other possibility is that the first electron, this is going to be impossible to do with two hands, the first electron has spin down and the second electron has spin up. Okay, All right? So those are the two possibilities. They're the two eigenstates of the system, this entangled system, if you like. So we could call them eigenstates. Now, in general, in quantum mechanics, you, you, you're always a bit of both. This is the whole Schrodinger's cat thing. You know, you're a mixture of this state, this combined state, describing both electrons, and this combined state, describing both electrons. You're really a mixture of both. Okay? Now, these electrons could be very far apart from one another. They may have been in causal contact, you know, and they may have been very close to one another at some point, but now they could be very far apart. So, they're either in this state, or this state, or this mixture of the two states. In fact, that's probably what we expect that they are, they're this superposition, this mixture of the two states. The rubber diamond really has nothing to do with it. What matters is you making a measurement. 
Okay, so I look at the electron here. So one electron's here, one's in Andromeda, say. I look at the electron here, and I try to measure its spin. Okay, now I can't, when I measure it, I can't detect that it's a mixture of both states. I can't detect that. I can only measure that it's spin up or spin down. So let me do that. I measure that it's got spin up, say. At the moment that I measure its, its spin up, I collapse what it calls collapse the wave function. That goes away, and I end up with just this state. That immediately tells me that the other electron that's on Andromeda has spin down. Okay. Now, some people say, okay, does that mean that you're actually can you, are you transmitting signals sort of faster than light? Because this is instantaneously you become aware of the fact that, uh, that this electron in, in Andromeda has spin down. And, and literally, the way, whole wave function collapses. You know? So you cause it to collapse here, and it causes this effect on the electron in Andromeda. And the answer is you can't actually... This, this has no violation of, uh, of relativity or of causality or anything like that. And the reason is, is you can't control which way the electron that you're measuring is going to spin. Okay? So... I measure the electron here. It's got spin up or down, 50-50 chance, say. Um, when the guy in Andromeda tries to measure his electron, sure, he, if I measure spin up and at the same time, he's definitely going to measure spin down. But there's no way of communicating that information from one to the other. Okay? I can't tell him that he's going to measure spin down. Well, I can, but he won't know about it until, you know, X number of, of years later. Okay, so if I could force the electron to spin what a way that I choose, then in principle I could send, so I could say I'm going to force it to go spin up. Then yes, you could use that to send an instantaneous signal to the guy in Andromeda because it would force his electron to spin down, and you could have a, you could agree what that meant in some sort of code. Right? But you can't force that spin. Quantum mechanics tells us that nature is inherently probabilistic. You can't force it to spin one way or the other. It's in this superposition of states and that the wave function just collapses one way or the other with some probability. You can't force it and that's the crucial point. Okay, that's why you can't send this signal across galaxies instantaneously. Brian Cox never said you could send signals across galaxies instantaneously. What did he say and why is it caused... What's the right and wrong of what he said? So, so, so he said that the, the energy levels... When you rub this diamond, the energy levels of the uh, of far away electrons will respond to that. Now, okay, and he said this was due to Pauli's exclusion principle. What he could have said was, if you look at a do a measurement of the electrons within the within the diamond, and you sort of try to measure their spin, then this entangled state, which is the whole universe, essentially that will choose a particular state for the electron here, which corresponds to a particular state for the electrons in Andromeda. Okay? It doesn't, so I don't want to just refer to energy levels because it's, it's much more complicated than that. There's a lot of other things that you could include. But it does affect, it, it, it's certainly true that the electron here cannot be in the same state as the electron in Andromeda if they're entangled. Who, with any credibility, has said that you can transmit information to Andromeda faster than light. Okay, can you get any better than this, Albert Einstein? <laughs> it was Albert Einstein who first proposed that, because he didn't, he never liked. He, you know, famously said. I actually was talking about this debate, but anyway. <laughs> but you know, so he he famously said that that, um, that you know God does not play dice, and it was this it was this scenario that literally, if you spin an electron one way, then one very far away would have to respond. Um, that uh, he used this as a reason to say, look, how, this is nonsense. This is incompatible with, with my theory of relativity. This is incompatible with what we think about locality, you know, the whole local nature of physics. Um, so, so this doesn't make sense. This proves that quantum mechanics is wrong. But now we understand that, it, you know... That you, 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 so you, Einstein said you couldn't do it either. Yeah, but why Einstein didn't... Re well, that's Einstein so Einstein didn't... So I come back to my original <laughs> question... Who with any credibility? What? Who are we debunking? No, no, no. Einstein. Einstein said that the whole probabilistic uh, uh, interpretation of quantum mechanics was nonsense as well. Show and this was the reason Brian for. Show me the Brian Cox video. Show me the Brian Cox video. All right, I'll video. find a Brian Cox. Oh, okay. Well, that's going to take ages. The universe instantly but imperceptibly change their energy levels, so everything is connected to everything else. I mean. The, 
there is some interconnectedness, but it, this, is, this oversimplifies it. And I think that's what's got people's backs up. Uh, like I said, so he's talking about energy levels there. Um, I mean, saying you can't have two electrons in the same energy level, but that's not entirely true. We know that in a helium atom, two electrons occupy the lowest energy level. The, the reason they can do that, the reason that doesn't violate Pauli's occlusion principle is because they have different angular momentum. So they're allowed to do it. So there is other quantum numbers that come into play. Uh, so, so other than just slightly simplifying things for the layman audience by calling them energy levels, when really he was talking about four or five perhaps different criterion, he hasn't said anything wrong, has he? Well, I think the, there's, there's, a, there's a subtlety as well. As he, when you're talking about rubbing the diamond, if he talked about uh, trying to measure the spin of the electrons or, or some, you know, some quantum, you know, some quantum number of, of, of the electrons, try to put, do a measurement on these electrons, that that would have caused an effect far away, then yes, you could kind of say that something's going on there. This is the whole business of wave function collapse and quantum entanglement. There's some truth in that, as, as, as we've just described. But uh, he didn't quite say that. So, so, you know, but guilty of some oversimplification, I think.